Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. The gang's all here to talk about last night's vice presidential debate. Senator Kamala Harris and Vice President Mike Pence met in Salt Lake City for the first and only vice presidential debate. USA Today's Susan Page moderated the 90-minute event where the two candidates were separated by 12 feet and two planes of plexiglass because Pence, who runs the White House COVID task force, may have been exposed to an infectious Donald Trump. Kamala spent most of the debate holding the president and Pence accountable for their record while making the case for the Biden-Harris ticket, while Pence tried to defend the Trump record, evade questions he didn't like, and interrupt Harris like this. Well, let's get so I, have, No, but Susan, I, this is important. Susan, I, and I, I, I want to add, but if, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. I have I'm speaking. Up. So aside from Pence's uh, very annoying interruptions, the debate was the, uh, the tame affair everyone asked for after last week's shit show between Trump and Biden. Though I did see a bunch of commentary saying it was too boring and forgettable. Um, what did you guys think? Wait, was it, it wasn't the shit show? Was it too boring? What, what, are, what kind of debate are we looking for here? Love it? <laughs> I don't, I look, boring is nice. I don't, I'm, I'm good for, I'm, I'm excited about boring. Uh, look, I think Trump shows up and he's blustery and he's interrupting and he's monstrous and he lies. Pence shows up and his whole ethos, his whole strategy, his whole uh, mode of being as a politician uh, is to lie while pretending Donald Trump doesn't exist, just acting as if everything that's happening and swirling around him is not real. That does make for something boring, but I do think uh, boring is pretty good for for us because they need something to change. They need something to change quickly. And a boring debate between Kamala Harris and Mike Pence in which Kamala Harris uh, delivers some pretty tough blows on the biggest issues facing the country like COVID and the ACA. Then they mix it up and Pence does fine on the economy or what have you. Uh, and then the next morning, Trump calls up Bartiromo and calls him calls Kamala Harris a monster is not the shift in the dynamic I think that they need. You know that that was on the message calendar. Um, <laughs> Dan, what did you think uh, Kamala's strategy was going into this debate and, uh, and how well did he execute? I think it was a three-part strategy. Part one was to continue to eviscerate the Trump-Pence record on COVID, which is obviously the most important issue in this campaign. Step number two was to take any opportunity she could to offer details on the Biden-Harris agenda. She was able to do that, I think, particularly well on uh, the Biden economic plan and the climate change plan. And then finally is to remind people as often as possible that as we sit here in the middle of this pandemic, Donald Trump and Mike Pence are in court trying to kick millions of Americans off health care. And she did that, I think, two or three times in the debate. So I think, you know, you have to judge these vice presidential debates differently than a presidential debate because historically these vice presidential debates don't move votes. They are about taking advantage of a large audience to provide potentially undecided voters with relevant information. And I think on that measure, Kamala Harris did incredibly well. I think if you were judging it on who won the debate between the two of them, she also won that debate handily, but she advanced her campaign's strategic agenda uh, much further than Mike Pence did their, their, the Trump agenda. Tommy, how do you think that she handled all of uh, Pence's interruptions? As well as she could. I mean, I'm going to Susan Page you, John, for a minute and just not answer a thing, a thing you asked by by just pointing out the fact that I'm really mad that the debate even happened. Like, it's very frustrating that Mike Pence was on a stage with her and, and not quarantining with his uh, breathless, frail, ailing boss. You know, like, they put everyone <laughs> at risk a week ago, and now we're supposed to pretend that a piece of plexiglass, like, solves the problem. I'm also frustrated that the debate commission still has not solved the problem of the interruptions. They've also created a structure that made these things pretty useless. I mean, Susan Page did better than Chris Wallace, but she apparently wasn't allowed to, to ask follow-up questions. So there was no one helping her when, when Pence was was trying to interrupt her. Uh, and there was no substance to the questions. Right? The point of the debate isn't civility. It's to get information that actually matters. And I, I don't know that they did this. I mean, I think, you know, I think all the polling we've seen so far today that shows that people liked both Kamala Harris on style and on substance. So that to me suggests she handled Pence's interruptions pretty well. But overall, I mean, I think the takeaway was a lot of conversation about the coronavirus, which wasn't necessarily good for the uh, the Trump side of the ledger. Can I just say, I, I do think that there was a difference between what happened with interruptions in the first debate and this debate. Uh, it is true that Pence, you know, spoke over 
Kamala Harris, he interrupted, he spoke too long. I will say, if a third of your points are being made while the moderator is saying, you know, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Pence, thank you, Mr. Pence, it becomes about the interruption. And I think the really, yeah. what I really appreciated about rude. how Kamala Harris handled those moments is I don't think it ever really prevented her from delivering the message she wanted to deliver. And she made moments out of needing to finish what she was saying and delivering some pretty good hits, even as he was sort of kind of interrupting her or interrupting Susan Page or what have you. I think she handled the interruptions masterfully. I think she was um, forceful, but polite. I think that uh, as a black woman, she knew this and her team knew this going in. She faces like all kinds of double standards and you have to walk a tightrope. Like we know this because we know how Hillary had to deal with us in debates. We've all worked with Barack Obama a black man who, you know, was sometimes concerned that he couldn't appear too angry um, because of the various stereotypes that he has to face out there. So she knew all this walking into that, walking into the debate. And I thought the way she handled it by being very forceful, but also polite was perfect. And then when I still saw some fucking undecided assholes, uh, white guys and, and Frank Luntz's focus group saying that she was too harsh or whatever. It, it really just bummed me out. <laughs> because Not that I was surprised that there's sexism and racism and double standards out there, but just because I watched it without trying to look at Twitter or any, you know, and just see how she did. And I was like, I, I couldn't, I don't think she could have handled it better with him interrupting all the time and, and her not being allowed to finish. I mean, it's very clear she has a lifetime of experience of being interrupted by dumb white guys, and she knows exactly how to handle it. Um, yeah. it I, it's not just these undecided voters in that focus group you mentioned who basically, as someone said on Twitter, I wish I remember who, that basically was like their comments was a lesson from a gender studies class in college, just how on the nose it was for uh, misogynistic tropes. But, it, I mean, the right wing leaned into this on Twitter. You know, you had Megyn Kelly uh, saying, take it like a woman, don't make a face, which is quite a thing to say for someone who worked at Fox News. You had a whole bunch yeah. of, uh, you know, Harlan Hill saying horribly offensive things about uh, Kamala Harris. It's like they absolutely cannot help themselves when confronted with a with a impressive showing by a woman, and particularly a black woman. It was just, they like, you would think there would be enough sense to just, like, take their foot off the gas, but they cannot help themselves and push the envelope. And I haven't looked at what the horrible content that's trending, right-wing content trending on Facebook is, but I have a pretty safe guess it's going to be all about this. Yeah. The, the one hopeful thing is, of course, there's a huge gender gap in the CNN poll about how she did, and we'll talk about the CNN poll later. But um, still, even with the gender gap, 48% of men thought she won versus 46% who thought she lost. So it was at least good to see that. But, um, you know, the, the right-wing assholes were out in force. Uh, how would you guys think that Susan Page did as a moderator? Um, we had some disagreement in our Slack channel over this. <laughs> Love it's a big Susan Page fan. Yeah, I Look, what I said at Dan, the end of the night. Dan, not so much. Uh, look, Dan and I really, you know, look, we do, we did mix it up in the group thread. I found, <laughs> I found that yes, there were some kind of both both sidesy questions going at the end of. Look, we just watched the worst debate in presidential history. We have a kind of raving steroid-addled uh, misinformation conspiracy theory spreading ma uh, monster in the White House. Uh, and the final question being from a teen about civility and actually allowing Mike Pence a, a place to talk about how important it is that we get over our differences is like a pretty extraordinary abdication, I think, of, of responsibility. I don't think you need to, I don't understand why it would be her job to ignore reality, right? Just there is a reality. Donald Trump is the the, you know, there was just a study that found he's not he's the leading source of misinformation on COVID. He's the leading divider uh, in our country. So that was a bit frustrating. That said, I found her questions on COVID. I found some of the, the questions directed at Pence to be pretty direct and not um, kind of not uh, 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 willing to kind of give Trump or Pence the benefit of the doubt. So, you know, I come away with a nuanced view. Like I've known Susan Page for a very long time. I think she is a, she's a wonderful person, and she's a, a phenomenal reporter, and she knows a lot about politics. Um, and I I agree with Lovett that her, her questions were really good. The problem isn't really with Susan Page; it's with the conception of a debate moderator as put forward by this absurd, ridiculous, completely pointless yes. debate commission. Yeah. The idea that a moderator should not see it as their role to ask follow up questions or to fact check obvious lies from candidates is absurd. There's no point in putting journalists there to just sort of shepherd them around and ask questions if you're not going to hold their feet to the fire. And this is the problem. You have a debate commission that is run by an 
like a 80 something year old Republican gaming lobbyist is we live in this world where fact checking is seen as partisan because Democrats use facts and Republicans lie. And <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I mean, you can't like they Republicans have been against debate moderators fact checking since Candy Crowley called Mitt Romney out for a lie on stage in the 2012 debate about Benghazi. And so now it is seen as unfair. Like, so Chris Wallace, a person whose brain has been somewhat pickled through prop news, racist Fox News, racist agit prop. But is a tough interviewer and fact checked the living hell out of Trump in that interview, felt like it was not his job to fact check. Right. So what is the point of having these people there? And so yeah. I agree, like I completely agree with Lovett that that last question was absurd. I thought the questions, it, there's nothing that should have prevented Susan Page from saying, you didn't answer my question. <laughs> like when they right. answered a completely opposite topic. But she, you know, she, I think she did very, she did as well as you can and be expected given the constraints that we've decided to put on debate moderators to make it easier for Mike Pence and Donald Trump to lie to the American people. I just, like she also said that her plan was to ask candidates some tough questions and some easy questions. Why plan to ask them yeah, that's a easy fair point. questions? Like, I, like if I wanted a substance list conversation where no one is challenged, I'd watch another episode of Emily in Paris, which is what I did after the debate was over. So you like, keep plugging that show. <laughs> Tommy, show you don't like. About, Tommy's been talking about Emily in all Paris he's, for he's, three days now. The Are opposite getting, of is love. Getting a Netflix check because we're doing not a lot hate. of work here. It's yeah, indifference. If you if you hate it, I think there's something going on. <laughs> Don't tell me what I like. <laughs> I'm going. I'm going to the next clip. Enough. I was going to ask you another question. All right, <laughs> let's let's break down a few of the notable moments. Uh, first question was about COVID, which Kamala called the greatest failure of any presidential administration in the history of our country, and pointed out several times in the debate that the White House is actively trying to dismantle the Affordable Care Act in the middle of a pandemic. Mike Pence, meanwhile, offered thoughts and prayers for those affected by coronavirus, equated criticizing the president with denigrating the sacrifices the American people have made, and even accused Joe Biden and Harris of plagiarizing the White House's response plan. Let's take a listen. The American people have witnessed what is the greatest failure of any presidential administration in the history of our country. And here are the facts. 210,000 dead people in our country in just the last several months. Over 7 million people who have contracted this disease. One in five businesses closed. We're looking at frontline workers who have been treated like sacrificial workers. The reality is when you look at the Biden plan, it reads an awful lot like what President Trump and I and our task force have been doing every step of the way. I mean, quite frankly, when I look at their plan that talks about advancing testing, creating new PPE, developing a vaccine. Um, it looks a little bit like plagiarism, which is something Joe Biden knows a little bit about. And I think the American people know that this is a president who has put the Thank health you, of Vice America president. first and the American people, I believe with my heart, can be Thank proud you, of the sacrifices yes. they have made. It's saved Thank countless you, Vice American Vice lives. Yes. Tommy, lame plagiarism joke aside that uh, anyone under 50 years old probably doesn't understand. Um, uh, what did you think of Mike Pence, basically? His, his response on COVID is, oh, we're ju they, they just want to do the same thing we are, as, his, like, as yeah. his, his red eyes are bulging out of his face. I don't know what was wrong with his fucking eyes the whole time. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, the, the plagiarism joke probably killed with uh, the 50 swing voters who have read What It Takes. Uh, speaking of killing swing voters, like, what, plagiarism? <laughs> what, what, I'm sorry, are they, are, they, are they infecting gold star families? That's your current plan, Mike Pence. Like, it's just... I realize that Pence has no case to make here. There is no spinning 200,000 people dead. It is still remarkable to me that their go-to uh, talking point is that they uh, instituted a travel ban to China back in February. And since then, they have fucked up every single thing since. And somehow that sort of absolves them from this. I just like I, Pence had no case. And it wasn't just that he got drilled in this opening segment. He kept pivoting back to a conversation about the coronavirus and, and like putting himself on ground that I think is probably the worst polling uh, issue they could be talking about. So I, I didn't think he got out of that in any way, shape or form. And I think, you know, Kamala Harris, like pretty thoroughly drilled him on their record here. Well, I, and I thought she did something interesting, which is she didn't spend a lot of time on Trump's diagnosis, his behavior, 
the Rose Garden thing. Yep. She brought it up at one point, but she really went to the larger record on the pandemic, and then she hit them on health care. Um, here's a clip of her talking about pre-existing conditions. On the one hand, you have Joe Biden, who was responsible with President Barack Obama for the Affordable Care Act, which brought health care to over 20 million Americans and protected people with pre-existing conditions. And what it also did is it saved those families who otherwise were going bankrupt because of hospital bills they could not afford. On the other hand, you have Donald Trump, who's in court right now, trying to get rid of, <laughs> Thank you, trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, which means that you will lose protections if you have pre-existing conditions. And I just, this is very important, Susan. Yes, and it's important. But we need to give, we need to give Vice President. I, I just like he stop. interrupted me, and I'd like to just finish, please. If you have a pre-existing condition, heart disease, diabetes, breast cancer. They're coming for you. If you love someone who has a pre-existing condition, Thank you. Thank they're you, Senator coming Harris. for you. If Nonsense. you are under the age of 26 on your parents' coverage, they're coming for you. Dan, I thought, um, I thought that was a great answer. And I also can't believe that we've now had two debates and at least Pence has not prepped an answer on ACA and pre-existing conditions. Like they just, can they just not defend this? What, what's going on? There's no answer. They have no plan. Like their plan is to take away the Affordable Care Act and fuck over millions of people. That has been their plan from the very beginning. And it is truly, I mean, it's both an example of how intellectually bankrupt their and cruel their approach is, but it's also, once again, not to pivot back the moderator, but Pence said they have a plan, which would have been a phenomenal time for Susan Page to say, D tell us your plan. And he didn't do that because he can't. And they like all this is he's they're sort of rerunning the 2018 Republican congressional playbook, which is just claim without evidence or regard for the truth that you protect people with preexisting conditions. But Josh Hawley did to get reelected to get elected. It's what a whole bunch of Republicans tried. It's what Trump is trying. And would you ha and that could possibly work for some candidates running in red states. But when you are someone who has zero credibility with the vast majority of voters like Trump and Pence do, then it gets very, very, very challenging. And that's they why it's are, so important that yeah. Kamala Harris brought it up repeatedly. They are relying on the fact that their position is so heinous, it doesn't seem plausible. They are relying on the fact that they can say, we will protect pre-existing conditions when their actual position is, we would like to eliminate the ACA without a replacement and cause untold havoc in people's lives. It's similar to choice as well, right? That's why Pence has to uh, uh, dodge the question on choice because their position is the same position he's had since he was the governor of Indiana, which is they would like to criminalize abortion. But of course that position is so heinous that they are relying on the fact that if they allied the truth on it, uh, not enough people will actually understand or truly countenance just how terrible the outcome of their actual policy preferences would be. So the issue of racial justice was also raised last night when the candidates were asked whether they felt that justice had been served in the case of Breonna Taylor. Mike Pence pivoted to a law and order argument, denied the reality of systemic racism in the United States, and began the following exchange with Kamala Harris. Here's a clip. And I must tell you, this, this, this presumption that you hear consistently uh, from Joe Biden and Kamala Harris that, uh, that America is systemically racist. Mm -hmm. And that, as Joe Biden said, that he believes that law enforcement has an implicit bias against minorities uh, is, is a great insult. And the reality of this is that we are talking about an election in 27 days where last week, the president of the United States took a debate stage in front of 70 million Americans and refused to condemn white supremacists. Not true. And Not true. it wasn't like he didn't have a chance. He didn't do it. And then he doubled down. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that very much. You know, I think this is one of the things that uh, makes people dislike the media so much in this country, Susan, is that you selectively edit, just like Senator Harris did comments that President Trump and I and others on our side of the aisle make. Tommy, is, uh, is Donald Trump's problem that he's selectively edited too often? Is that that's the <laughs> yeah. problem? Yeah, uh, 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 community theater Reagan impersonator Mike Pence thinks they selectively edited a live debate that we all watched last week. Mike Pence seemed offended on behalf of systemic racism and I guess also <laughs> like data. <laughs> I mean, like, like we, we've, we've had this conversation since June. There's been so much polling on, on how people feel about racial justice, about policing. 
we all know that public opinion is on the side of the Biden-Harris position on this. I think that's the third issue area, fourth issue area we've talked about so far on the show, where all available evidence suggests that Mike Pence and Trump are taking the wrong side of an issue when it comes to trying to actually attract voters. So, yeah, this one didn't go all that well for Mike, I thought. Well, you could also tell, like, he, he so clumsily pivoted to what he was obviously going to pivot to as soon as humanly possible, which <coughs> yeah. there's a discussion about Breonna Taylor's case, and he immediately goes to rioting and looting and, and, and you know, the, the poor police and stuff like that because he thinks that's right. the only strong territory. So I actually think that, right. I think that Kamala did really, really well zooming back to talk about Trump the guy who's running for president being a racist on stage at the debate. <laughs> right. I mean, look, the, 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 the bottom line is like there were several high profile cases of black Americans being murdered by police this summer. And, and Mike Pence could not find it within himself to have empathy for those individuals who were killed. He had to go to violence. He had to try to make it some sort of blue lives matter wedge issue. And it, he's not good at this. It came through. It seems cynical to me. He's a dimwit. <laughs> he really is. Yeah, he Dan, is. you and I both were making this way. Like he was known for being dumb. Yeah, I, I thought the whole thing was a good example of like how Trumpism doesn't necessarily work without Trump, because like Mike Pence, he doesn't get to do his own sort of Republican spiel. He has to be constantly defending Donald Trump and saying things like Donald Trump would say. But even his whole shtick about the media, Susan, this is why people don't like the media. Like. It just doesn't it doesn't come off well from Mike Pence. I mean, it doesn't come off well from Donald Trump either. But at least with Trump, it's like part of his act. Mike Pence just looks like a fucking he, he's, well, you're right, he's a bad Reagan impersonator. It's um, I feel like throughout the debate. You felt the kind of scale of of coronavirus, of protest against police brutality and systemic racism, economic dislocation, like the scale of the problems, like the actual crises that we're in made lines about plagiarism lines about oh riots and then tifa like these little tiny hits they just don't work we're not ju we're just not at that level things are too bad the crises are too deep there's too much chaos in the white house for these little kind of pathetic childish hits and media hits and all the rest to land like we're not in that we're not in that headspace as a country. We are in an emergency, and this shit just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Yeah. So one of Pence's uh, strategic objectives clearly was to paint the Biden-Harris ticket as extreme leftists. One of the tactics during the debate was clearly going to be, you know, um, Kamala Harris has a more progressive record than Joe Biden wanted to like find the differences in their record, exploit them. You know, the Trump people have been trying to paint them as all secret leftists this entire campaign. Uh, here are a few examples of how that went when Pence tried it. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris want to raise taxes. They want to bury our economy under a two trillion dollar Green New Deal, which you were one of the original co-sponsors of in the United States Senate. They want to abolish fossil fuels and ban fracking, which would cost hundreds of thousands of American jobs all across the heartland. Joe Biden will not raise taxes on anyone who makes less than $400,000 a year. He has been very clear about that. Joe Biden will not end fracking. He has been very clear about that. <laughs> Joe Biden is the one who, during the, the Great Recession, was responsible for the Recovery Act that brought America back. And now the Trump-Pence administration wants to take credit when they, ran, when they rode the coattails of Joe Biden's success for the economy that they had at the beginning of their term. Of course, now the economy is a complete disaster. So, um, Dan, how do you think that Kamala handled both the tax hit and the, um, and the Green New Deal hit? Uh, very well, I thought. I mean, it, it's, it's sort of this absurd, uh, not particularly well thought out tactic in these vice presidential debates to, to say, well, yeah, sure, the guy at the top of the ticket doesn't believe this, but you believe it. Therefore, what? Right? It doesn't make a lot of sense. And it is, it's just, and I think a lot of the entire, Pence's entire approach, and I think Shaniqua McClendon, Crooked Media's political director, said this in the group thread last night, is he was just trying to get to the minimum word count on his college essay. Because he was just saying, <laughs> just trying to, like, he wasn't trying to achieve anything. He was just trying to say words to get to the end of the time. And I think having her say on camera that, 
Joe Biden is not going to raise taxes on anyone who makes less than $400,000 is very, very powerful. And it's sort of shows how one dimensional the Trump Pence strategy is, is they led with that. Like you knew that was going to come when you said it. That is the fact that Trump cuts taxes for the rich and Joe Biden raises taxes on the rich is a point in Joe Biden's favor with the overall majority of voters, including a majority of Trump voters. And so opening the door to that is particularly stupid. I mean, it's not stupid for Pence to try to say as many times as possible that Joe Biden is going to ban fracking in Pennsylvania. Like they're, they've done that in advertising. They've done that in mail out there. But it, it once again gave her the opportunity to say he's not and to talk about what their plan was and to talk about uh, their plan, what the Biden, the, some of the details of the Biden Harris climate plan, which I think is to their benefit to have that conversation. I do sort of wonder there was a there was a tax exchange where she said, you know, he's not going to raise taxes on anyone making under four hundred thousand dollars a year. Pence said, oh, if you repeal the Trump tax cuts, obviously that's going to raise some taxes on middle class people because some of the even though most of the Trump tax cuts were just for the rich and for corporations, there are some that were on more middle class, and she just didn't answer that question i'm sort of i'm sort of wondering like what biden will do in the next debate if asked that obviously trump's not going to nail him down because trump doesn't have the the uh the, the mental wherewithal the, to do that or the lung cap- or the lung capacity or the lung capacity <laughs> yeah. but i could i could imagine a moderator trying to nail him down on that <laughs> well i think I also it's just like we also have kind of like covid goggles on like yeah like that was like a real exchange it's actually a winning issue for democrats it's not as clean as they failed on the greatest crisis in a hundred years and the only thing that matters so yeah like there was a back and forth it wasn't a totally clean hit that's okay like in a whole debate in which the most important two issues affordable care act and covid uh she managed to land just absolutely withering hits uh and pence had nothing to say uh I think matters more than the fact that there was a bit of a kind of like spongy tax exchange, by the way, that came after a great hit on Trump paying seven hundred fifty dollars in taxes and owing four hundred million dollars to God knows who. That was really good. There was also a Supreme Court question uh, where he kept trying to pin her down on, will you pack the court? Are you expanding the court? She also just did not take the bait on that one. Tommy, that's another one that will surely come up if there is another debate. Trump thinks, you know, they all think this is a winning issue because the pundits all think that, you know, this is a winning issue too for them (laughs) because Biden and Harris haven't said whether they will expand the Supreme Court or not or whether they're even considering it. Do you think they can continue to just not answer that question or is there a better answer? I, I mean, look, my personal take is like, I don't I don't need to hear Joe Biden say he will pack the court and expand it before the election. I, I, I'm OK with them skirting it. I'm not sure it's the best answer where we've landed. It, it seems a little rough, a little tumultuous. Like there's a way you could just throw it to Congress and say, actually, that's up. That's up to the Senate. That's up to the House to vote on whether or not they would do that. That wouldn't be up to the executive. It seems like that would be an easy way out of it. I'm kind of skeptical the people really care. I think these guys live in in MAGA land where people automatically know what the Green New Deal is and automatically think it's bad. I'm not sure that's the case. You know, like that tax hit was the only area where I thought maybe they made up some ground. I wish Biden and and Harris had a little bit better a court packing answer. But um, yeah, I I don't know. Like, do I think people came away from that debate last night thinking, hmm, I might not support Biden and Harris because they might pack the courts? No, nobody. Would be my I mean, guess. I, I, I would try and answer like Mitch McConnell in 2016 single handedly changed the size of the court when he stole that seat, the Gorsuch seat. And since then, he has completely packed the courts, Supreme Courts, Circuit Courts, Federal Courts with the most extreme right wing judges. And now he's trying to do it again before an election while people are already voting. People don't want this justice to be seated before an election, and he's going to do it anyway. We're we're fighting as hard as we can to stop him from packing the court right now. And we're, we're going to try to stop him from doing that first, and then we'll see what happens afterwards. But I'm going to focus on the fight in front of us first. Like, yeah. just say something like that. Yeah, I, or just I, I, ha- I, hand him a balloon and say, "Inflate this before I answer the rest of your questions." See if you can inflate this thing. It's on your own. And you can't use your oxygen tank next to you either. Don't try to use the tank. I look. I I get that. I think I feel like there's two options, right? There's like kind of there's you know, John. I saw you talking about this on Twitter. Like you can basically just say like, "I hope it doesn't come to it," but if they push us, like, fuck yeah, we'll do it, right? But there's also a kind of version of like a forlorn, like I really hope it doesn't come to that. Like I just yeah, hope no, we can I, fight I this. Think- 
I hope we fight this nomination. I think we can defeat this I nomination. Agree. I, I hope agree. they don't pack the court. And if and other than that, I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals. I'm trying to get this fight done, and hopefully we can stop Amy Coney Barrett, Shh. and it'll never come to that. Schumer gave them the answer. Schumer when said, I'm not taking anything off the table. And everyone was like, oh my God, Schumer left that on the table. And then that's it. Then no one said anything to him again. He's fine. Chuck Schumer went on his merry way. Yeah, he just went <laughs> no out to shoot more, to short, shoot more vampire fundraising videos for YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> hey, hey, you, <laughs> Dan. What do you think? I know you've written. You've written a lot. I, you're a big fan of uh, court expansion. We don't call it packing, guys. We call it rebalancing, <laughs> perhaps. Court rebalancing. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Look, I am for court adding renovating. justice to the court. court. <laughs> yes. <laughs> A little look, sprucing up. We're sprucing up yeah. the court. Look, yeah, I, look, I court redecorating. I, I think that dais would look better with two additional chairs on either end. That's what I personally <laughs> think. It's feng shui for yeah. court feng shui. <laughs> look, 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 I think look, we, you, you call it the restaurant. You had two seats to the table. It's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I think that answer, John, that you gave is right. There's no, they need a better answer to it. I do think one thing that was very powerful that Kamala Harris did, which is an absolutely stunning fact that we should get more attention, is that Donald Trump hasn't appointed a black person to the court. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Yeah, I know. No, I, that learned that. I learned that. I learned that. Yeah, that was a good, I learned good something answer. from the debate. Yeah, I mean, that is that really absolutely good. my point. We should say that more often. I think there is... The Chuck Schumer answer is the right answer, and there's and I think the forlorn tone is the right way to do it. Um, there is one audience in addition to uh, prominent court packers like ourselves to hear that, <laughs> and it is uh, John Roberts, mm. who is going to have to make a whole bunch of decisions in the coming months with a completely rigged court, and he is someone who has shown in the past to have some very real concerns about his legacy as it relates to the to the fate of the court and the idea that decisions that he makes that are very clearly putting his thumb on the electoral scale could lead to a, a changing of the court uh, matters a lot. I think that I believe that that is part of what Schumer is doing by saying that is sending a message, you know, taking it off the table gives Roberts free will to do something, not just on ACA and Roe, but also on in a nightmare scenario in a Bush v. Gore too. And the idea that that ha is going to have some consequences in the back of his head, I think is important. I also That's think, smart. I think there's one other piece of this too, which is the, the lack of an answer has led, I think, to a lot of Republicans who are trying to kind of make intellectually dishonest arguments in favor of doing the confirmation is, doesn't matter what we do, they're going to pack the court. And I think the reality, of course, is Joe Biden is incredibly reluctant to do something like this. He is an institutionalist to the core. And so making it clear that, like, despite, I think, what a lot of left wing activists and progressive activists would want, which is to pack the court no matter what, for Joe Biden to say, uh, not explicitly, but basically say, uh, I hope it doesn't come to that. I don't want to do that. But if they push us, we may have no choice, I think kind of kind of speaks to both sides renovate the court um after <laughs> after 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 not hearing a lot about foreign policy in the first debate susan page did ask a few questions about this kamala harris talked about rebuilding alliances while mike pence talked about crushing isis pence attacked biden for opposing the decision to take out qasem Soleimani. harris responded by pointing out all the ways donald trump has disrespected those who serve in the military here's a clip so after the strike on Soleimani, there was a counter strike on our troops in iraq and they suffered serious brain injuries. And do you know what Donald Trump dismissed them as? Headaches. And this is about a pattern of Donald Trump's, where he has referred to our men who are serving in our military as suckers and losers. The American people deserve to know Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian general, was responsible for the death of hundreds of American service members. When the opportunity came, we saw him headed to Baghdad to kill more Americans. President Trump didn't hesitate, and Qasem Soleimani is gone. But you deserve to know that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris actually criticized the decision to take out Salem, uh, Qasem Soleimani. It's really inexplicable, but with regard to Joe Biden, it's, it's explainable. Because history records that Joe Biden actually opposed the raid against Osama bin Laden. Tommy, what do you think about that exchange? I mean, I don't think anyone really understood what they were talking about. I mean, just for, for our <laughs> listeners, right? I mean, they assassinated Qasem Soleimani in January. 
the Iranians responded with this massive missile strike. They tried to play it down like nothing happened. And as Kamala Harris mentioned, like I think 100 service members uh, had traumatic brain injuries, which was a big deal. The, the, the reason they said they had to assassinate a senior military leader uh, in Iran uh, was because they were providing material support to all these Shiite militia groups in Iraq that were attacking U.S. service members in the region. That, what they call, they call that deterrence. But just like last week we learned that that deterrence is going so poorly that the United States might have to fully withdraw uh, U.S. embassy personnel from our embassy in Baghdad, which is an embassy the size of Vatican City that cost a billion dollars to build, which is one of the most heavily fortified embassies on the planet, right? So the policy they are describing in terms of killing Soleimani has completely failed. But then Pence goes on to totally debase himself by raising his two his children in their military service as a shield to defend Donald Trump, who he knows damn well said troops who died are suckers and losers. We know that because General Kelly has refused to uh, deny the reports that were originally in the Atlantic. So, you know, I, what this showed me was like, again, Mike Pence is willing to say and do anything, even cheapen the service of his own family members in service of Donald Trump. <laughs> Um, let's talk about the post-debate reaction. Uh, instant polling by CNN showed Kamala Harris as the decisive winner, 59-38%. Harris also saw her favorability ratings rise from 56% before the debate to 63% after, while Pence's favorability numbers with the poll didn't budge an inch, remaining at 41%. Um, uh, an Ipsos poll with 538 found pretty much the same thing. Uh, everyone, th you know, sorry, the majority of voters thought that Kamala Harris did better than Pence. The majority of voters liked her policies better than Pence's. And she saw her favorability rise to plus 10 in that poll. And, and Mike Pence's remained at negative 14. <laughs> Didn't move at all. Um, so, you know, what, if anything, did each campaign achieve here? And how much will this debate matter at all? Dan? I think there was an opportunity to deliver a message to what I assume was tens of millions of people watching this debate, some of whom are undecided about whether they're going to vote and undecided about who they're going to vote for. The polling shows, common sense shows that Kamala Harris did a much better job of that opportunity than Pence did. But it, the vice presidential debate is not a huge event on the path to election day. But it, it, but it's, it is a moment that matters. And when you are winning, as Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are, every time one of these moments passes and you are still winning, that is good. And so they should feel very good about where they are today. Uh, love it. Yeah, I agree with that. I also, one thing we didn't talk about is just that um, uh, Kamala the Harris- fly? Took Oh, a, we didn't talk about the fly. Uh, Shit. We also didn't, yeah, we also forgot to talk about the fly. Well, you know, I think a few people on Twitter have mentioned it. Uh, I think that the, uh, <laughs> Uh, she also took a chance to kind of tell her bio, to do her bio. And I think that there was value to that because, you know, there, like Susan Page asked the question at the end that referenced it. Neither one really answered it, but it is present that both that Joe Biden is older and there is a, you know, a question as to whether who would run for reelection. And the fact that she would just took an opportunity to, to like run through her qualifications, talk about uh, um, her past, I think has value. Um, and, you know, all in all, uh, what what did Mike Pence do to convince millions upon millions of Americans that the Trump administration has failed abysmally on the biggest challenges facing the country? I don't think anything. I don't think there is anything he could say. Their positions are indefensible, uh, and he didn't succeed. Um, that's it. Tommy, will anyone be talking about this this time tomorrow? This time today? I'm, no. <laughs> I'm shocked we're talking no. about it right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am too, right? Because 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 Donald Trump decided to unburden himself to Maria Bartiromo for like 35, 45 minutes this morning and said a bunch of batshit stuff, and so we're talking about that instead. But what was interesting to me it was in a debate that was pretty combative, and often when you're sort of like engaged in political combat, people don't like either side, right? Kamala Harris still managed to improve her favorability ratings in that CNN poll. It went from fifty six percent to 63%. And I do think that was directly attributed to 
the way she handled herself. I also agree, love it. I thought that that question early on when she decided to just not even come close to answering whatever the question <laughs> was and just tell a story about herself and her parents and her upbringing was like a very savvy moment to just tell the story and sort of leaven what had been kind of a, a tough back and forth with just some sort of hopeful, optimistic two minutes. Like Hannah, Hannah couldn't watch the debate. And then when that happened, she came and sat down next to me for, you know, a minute and a half until she left again when Pence started talking. So the winner tonight was civility, guys. <laughs> I mean, I just, I can't emphasize enough how difficult it is to debate when you're up there. Like I saw a lot of people on Twitter, say, to the extent that Kamala Harris got criticism, some people were like, oh, she missed an opportunity to hit him here or she could have hit him here, you know? Like the, yeah. the, the sheer Dumb. number of things that you have to keep in your mind when you're sitting on that debate stage for 90 minutes, first of all, imagine the anxiety. You're in front of like tens of millions of Americans. More, she's had a bigger audience than she's ever had in her life, right? Same with Mike Pence, same with anyone who does one of these presidential debates. And... Um, and then you have prepped all this time, so you have lines that you have to deliver, you have moments that you're trying to hit, and then whatever your plan is, it's constantly getting interrupted by whatever the moderator wants to do and whatever Mike Pence wants to do. So the fact that you have all those things going on, and she still was able to check off everything on her list, right? Like, talked about her bio, talked about Biden's economic plan, did the healthcare hit, did the COVID hit. Like, she got so much done during that debate while being interrupted, I thought it was a really, really impressive performance. It's probably one of the most impressive debate performances we've seen in a very long time. Yeah. Right? yeah. I that mean, it's really easy to get <laughs> lost in frustration with the moderators and the presence of plexiglass and all of that, but she is a phenomenally talented communicator and she delivers in big moments. She talks like a human, which is something we talk about all the time. She doesn't use political jargon. She looks directly into the camera and she has, as you said, a punch list of things she wants to accomplish with the audience that she has. And she went through, I imagine, pretty close to that entire list. And that is something yeah. that should be incredibly applauded. And this is she, like this is one of those moments where she has everything to lose. Biden is winning. The press is just chomping at the bit for something it could possibly do for a change in narrative. And she is a black woman on national television dealing with a press corps and, and set of pundits who still abide by a lot of the racist and misogynistic tropes. You saw it in the coverage of her in the primary debates. You saw it in the coverage of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama in their previous debates. And to do that on with that much pressure on with the highest stakes, the most important election in history is incredibly impressive. And it shouldn't get lost because a fly landed on Mike Pence's head. Um, uh, as Tommy mentioned, you know, thanks to Donald Trump, the debate is already out of the news cycle. Uh, Patient Zero did a phone interview with MAGA pundit uh, Maria Bartiromo, where he twice called Kamala Harris a monster, attacked his attorney general and FBI director for not yet indicting Barack Obama, Joe Biden, and Hillary Clinton, and blamed Gold Star military families who've lost loved ones for giving him COVID-19. Trump also announced he will not be participating in the next presidential debate because the Commission on Presidential Debates has chosen a virtual format in order to protect people from a potentially infectious Donald Trump. So Biden campaign released a statement saying they were prepared to accept the virtual format. But now that Trump has pulled out, Biden will find a way to take questions from voters on October 15th and has asked the commission to move the Biden Trump town hall debate to October 22nd, which is the date of the third and final debate. Then the Trump campaign came back and said, OK, we'll do that. But we still want the third debate now on October 29th, which is a few days before the election. And the Biden campaign said, fuck off, do the virtual debate if you want. Um, what do you guys think of this move? What do you think of Trump's meltdown this morning? Uh, love it? <laughs> what do I think of it? <laughs> uh, like, you know, uh, he's spinning out. He clearly is seeing, uh, I think that the virtual debate would have been, he obviously refu is refusing to say yes to the virtual debate because uh, it highlights the fact that he is sick and contagious because of his recklessness and incompetence in controlling a pandemic, not just nationally, but in his own home. Uh, so obviously a virtual debate would be an advertisement for his failures. That's not the also the mute fault. button. Got that mute button also, there, too. Well, the, Right. Yeah. The mute button is deadly to him. He can't be muted. Um, so uh, it's embarrassing uh, to admit reality. I mean, you know, that's not the commission's fault. That's not Joe Biden's fault. So I think all in all, I think he's seeing the polls. He is seeing reviews of Mike Pence favorably compared to his own performance. He is seeing the fact that his tax returns are uh, being um, 
uh, exposed in uh, legal proceedings in New York, and uh, uh, he is um, lashing out unhelpfully. <laughs> Tommy, I um, I feel like the Biden campaign is on pretty firm ground here, <laughs> um, <laughs> saying that like you think look, they came yeah. up with a virtual debate. You said no. We're not going to do your fucking October 29th, three days before the election final debate. Do the debate that the commission asked. He has COVID. <laughs> and, they, and he probably had it at the last debate. And they lied about it. Like, I, the, Biden de- the Biden people should never walk in the room with him again. He is an unhinged, unhealthy old man who should go get bed rest or do whatever he needs to do to get healthy. And, like... Just for like, I think the Biden campaign is doing exactly what they should do. Just to just step back for one second about how ridiculous the Trump campaign strategy is. He spent like 30 minutes, 45 minutes on the phone with Maria Bartiromo on Fox Business. How many people watch that show? 200,000? 300,000? Like, that was how you spent your time today? He also attacked Mike Pompeo for not releasing Hillary Clinton's emails. He said Don Jr., his son, couldn't win in New York City. It was just like your classic... Donald Trump ranting, raving nonsense. He sounds to me like a man who knows he's going to lose and he doesn't know how to fix it. And he's just going to bitch and moan until the votes are cast. Dan, uh, isn't it in his interest to, to do two more debates, to, to accept two more debates? Like he's behind, right? Like why wouldn't you I mean, try? If he wasn't an incoherent, raving lunatic... Right. I mean, that's the problem. Like when his the best thing for Trump to do to have any chance to win this election would be to stop talking. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like every like his presence on that stage was a disaster for him the last time. His presence on the stage the next time will also probably be a disaster for him. And even if he were to be able to do an OK job and then have Biden make some sort of mistake, which I can't really fathom what that would be that would overcome the fact that. Donald Trump gave himself COVID after failing to respond to a pandemic that's killed 210,000 Americans. Throw some salt Donald over Trump- your back. Dan, you can't just say, I can't fathom what it is, and then just leave it there. You got to throw some salt behind you. You got to do something. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we're, gonna, we're actually going to have to edit. We're going to have to edit that out <laughs> for karma's sake. <laughs> Sacrifice that for karma. Knock it on the wood. But even, if, let's, say, let's say he did make a, mis- make a mistake. Like, Donald Trump would just call Fox and Friends the next morning and draw attention back to himself again. And so, like, just when you read the summary of what Donald Trump said on Maria Bartiromo this morning, which I did not, like, waking up to that in midstream was really jarring this morning and seeing the tweets about it. it. But you read, (laughs) but you read that list of things. And it reminds me of something. (laughs) Many, many, many years ago, Ron Klain, who's one of Biden's top advisors, and I were, uh, were advising a, a, uh, a candidate at the same time, and the candidate did something absolutely insane. And I called Ron to tell him what it was, and Ron said to me, Dan, that is an A-plus answer to a political science question of how do you lose an election? And so, like, that's <laughs> what that was. And uh, it was just, it's truly mind-boggling that he would do those things. And it actually says a lot about how totally fucked up the American political system is that Donald that this race is still not over yet, despite Donald Trump doing those things on a regular well, basis. Well, I was th- I was thinking about that too. I think there's so much noise. Like there are so many crazy Trump statements. He's putting out these fucking videos from the White House. That you know, just before we started recording, he's he's he did he did a direct address to seniors where he called them vulnerable and then promised them a free <laughs> cure. Like hey, everyone, like I'm a you get a Regeneron, you get a Regeneron, you get a Re-, like he's promising he's promising treatments to everyone. <laughs> he like in that paragraph I just I just read like blaming the Gold Star families for giving him COVID, even though he met with them the day after the Rose Garden ceremony. So it's very likely that he infected Gold Star families with COVID-19 in the same breath as he's calling on, on, on his attorney general to fucking indict Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, and Joe Biden, which is like something that because he's done it so many times now, we just were like, oh yeah, there he goes again, calling for the imprisonment of all his political opponents. Ha <laughs> ha, crazy Trump. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, um, look, I... I think the serious part about all of this is is this person has always been unfit. He's always been monstrous. It's just sort of fully revealed now. There's nothing else left. There's just failure and the kind of purest and worst form of Trump. And and the 
it ultimately is a reminder that this election isn't really about him. Like, he is who he is. He is monstrous. He can't shift. He has no strategy. He can't fix it. The only question is, is the brokenness in our system, is the propaganda all around him, is the rot that allows him to be taken seriously and treated as though uh, there's an actual political debate in our country, uh, is all of that enough to overcome, like, democracy and the basics, the the kind of basic virtues of politics in which we claim to have a debate about our differences that we adjudicate in front of the American people. Like, are those forces of kind of brokenness and institutional decline able to overcome the good work and the democracy that everybody is fighting for? And uh, I hope the answer is yes, but I don't think anyone should pretend uh, it's a sure thing. Yeah, I, my takeaway from this morning is like, look, anything can happen. He could still win. We all need to just do the work. But like the first debate, the VP debate, this call this morning, it just reminds you how much they have lost the thread. Like in 2016, he had a message. It was like, I'm not a Washington insider. Crooked Hillary's emails are bad. He used to hit her on trade all the time. Now they're just flailing. And like Mike Pence is flailing along with him. That closing bit he did about the Russia probe and the, you know, spied on my campaign, like that nonsense is for an audience of one. That is designed to make Donald Trump happy. It is not designed to win a campaign. So they are just like they're not doing anything to help themselves win. Meanwhile, they're pulling down ad buys in like every state that matters. Like, look, I'm not trying to be cocky or I'm not predicting shit, but like they're not setting themselves up for success. No, they're, they're, there's no message. You're totally right. They're flailing. Obviously, we all look for things to be anxious about all the time because of 2016 and because of who we are. Like, you know, it is, it's October 8th. There are, uh, well, there'll be three weeks left next Tuesday. So a little more than three weeks left. That is a lot of time left on the clock for Donald Trump. Um, maybe he can come up with some closing message. Maybe he can be a little more coherent. Maybe he, you know, he's trying to mail seniors $200 drug cards, or at least say he's going to, <laughs> paid for by them, <laughs> paid for by taxpayers. Um, so he's going to try to like every trick in the book, every abuse of power he can think of, he's going to try it out in the next three weeks. And I do think, you know, I, I think to myself like, Last Monday was the tax story, the tax story before the debate, before the COVID diagnosis. That all happened in the last week. <laughs> in the last um, three weeks has been the Atlantic story, the Woodward story, the taxes, <laughs> two debates, and Trump getting COVID. Three weeks. So anything Not to mention happen, a Supreme Court seat opening up. Yes, yes. And Supreme Court seat. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's the other thing. Like, you know, they're gonna, Democrats are going to do whatever they can to stop Amy Coney Barrett from being nominated. But again, like we said before, Mitch McConnell has the votes, he changes the rules, he can do whatever he want as the guy that runs the Senate. So we should, you know, we should fight like hell, but we should not kid ourselves that it's very possible they could seat her and then that's another win for Trump or whatever. So stay vigilant in these last three weeks. But like you said, Tommy, there is, there is no closing message or argument like there was in 2016. Did you see um, that Mitch McConnell today said he hasn't been to the White House in two yes. months? Yes. Yeah. yeah, and took a <laughs> shot at Trump. He's he said smart. he hasn't been there because they don't do social distancing like I want. That's basically what he said. Trump yeah. gonna like He knows that. he's the last line of defense for uh, racially – he's the last line of defense for minority rule, and he cannot put himself at risk. He, he's basically the uh, designated survivor, so he can go nowhere yeah. near Trump. But also today we learned that Mark Meadows – uh, in May, hosted a 70-person wedding for his daughter where no one wore masks, no one socially distanced, and they did this in Atlanta. So, you know, rules uh, for thee, not for me. It's just plutocracy assholes. I, I mean, it's a, shock, it's a shock that didn't happen in the Rose Garden. Yeah, seriously. Another story, another scandal. It's just There's just too many. Um, all right, if you'd like to donate in these last few weeks and want to make sure you get the most bang for your buck, we've got you covered. Go to votesaveamerica.com slash donate, and you'll find our housekeeping fund so you can help the most competitive house races, our fuck gerrymandering fund so you can help flip the most competitive state legislature races, our get Mitch fund so you can help flip the Senate, and our every last vote fund to fight voter suppression and protect the right to vote. Any amount helps, and these funds are the best way to make sure 100% of your donation is used strategically. So just go to votesaveamerica.com slash donate. Uh, to help out and get more information. 